we have Dr. Samantha Nolan, who has a background in marine biology and aquaculture, and now works at the Darwin Aquaculture Centre as an aquaculture research scientist for the Northern Territory Government's Aquaculture Unit. Her particular areas of interest include tropical aquaculture, women's leadership in, sea in the seafood industry, sustainable development of fisheries and aquaculture, and community empowerment through economic development. Samantha is currently working alongside Indigenous communities to support the establishment of tropical rock oyster aquaculture. And her seminar today is titled Productive Partnerships, Tropical Rock Oyster Farming in the Northern Territory, which will discuss the development of the Northern Territory Government's Tropical Rock Oyster Aboriginal Economic Development Program on Golden Island in Arnhem Land, where she is at the moment. And it will also cover extension practices and challenges and potential of Aboriginal-led oyster farms. Um, so please enjoy and I will hand you over to Sam. Thanks, Melanie. And hello, everyone that's joined today. Yeah, today I'll talk about productive partnerships, tropical rock oyster farming in the Northern Territory. Um, and the full program title is a bit of a mouthful, so you did pretty well there, Melanie. So basically where it all started, traditional owner aspirations. Traditional owners were interested in farming oysters and approached the Northern Territory Fisheries Unit. So oysters have been historically harvested by Aboriginal communities for food and trade, and there's a lot of local knowledge around different oyster species. It's also an employment opportunity that can be culturally aligned with employment and staying on country and different economic development opportunities. So the species that was chosen as a focus species was black lip rock oysters. And there's a photo, this photo on the right here is um, them once they've been farmed. They grow quite flat and big in the wild. Um, so it's a native species, occurs across the Northern Territory. So this is a good trait because lots of communities across the NT can benefit from the NT fisheries investing in developing this species. Uh, also it's a native species, so Unlike the Pacific oyster, which you would normally would be normally what you eat in restaurants, um, that's an introduced species. So we couldn't bring that to the we can't bring introduced species to the Northern Territory. Um, it's a large oyster species, which is really good for aquaculture because um, promising growth rates. The faster you get your um, animal to market, the quicker you can make return on your investment. They're found across the Northern Territory, but most importantly, they really taste great. Uh, just to let everyone know where we are in Australia, so Darwin's right at the north in the Northern Territory. So here on the map, uh, this is where I am today at the Darwin Aquaculture Centre. If you can see my cursor, I'm sitting about in here. And so we're an aquaculture park facility uh, located on Channel Island, just outside of Darwin. And we're a multi-species hatchery. So we hire out different parts of the centre to commercial aquaculture um, producers, so for barramundi, sea cucumbers uh, and pearl oysters. But we also do, do research. So we have a, a team of um, government employees that run the centre, but also do different research and, and economic development opportunities. Um, so in the past, we've done barramundi, um, mud crabs, dewfish, golden snapper, giant clams and tropical rock oysters is now a major project. And Goulburn Island is about 300 kilometres east of Darwin. So the best way to get there and the quickest way is by plane. So we fly from Darwin across to South Goulburn Island, which is in Arnhem Land. Takes about an hour in the plane. So when I talk about the island today, I'll be talking about Goulburn Island in Arnhem Land and uh, the aquaculture centre and the hatchery are all based in Darwin. Um, so Golden Island formed a tropical oyster advisory group and Yug, which is part of Yugbani Aboriginal Corporation, which is the main corporation on the island that runs a lot of the different islands programs. So the executive board also acted as a tropical oyster advisory group, which makes decisions about how oyster farming develops on the island. And it's community ownership. The board is made up of all the traditional owners from the different clan groups on the island. And the goal for the Northern Territory Government was to support Aboriginal ownership and business development. Uh, this is Bunal Galaminda, he's the chair of Yagbani Aboriginal Corporation. Uh, he's, we filmed him saying a few things. Bunal was just talking about the oyster farm is supported by the community uh, and that's how they're moving forward. 
Um, so basically you start with wild oysters, which are your brood stock in aquaculture, so your animal, your breeding stock. Uh, and we, it's important we worked with local people to collect these because there's a lot of local knowledge about where they occur. Uh, and in a lot of places that are really close to the community, they're usually in very low numbers because they're harvested and eaten locally. Uh, so you have to go out a little bit further and have quite a good eye to be able to spot them. So you can see here in hand, they do blend in quite well and they get quite muddy on top. And then these broodstock oysters are collected on Goulburn Island and they're sent back to Darwin for breeding at the aquaculture centre. We also tried wild spat collection. So spat are the juvenile oysters uh, and it's a, it's a potential alternative to hatchery breeding. So you can put out these spat collectors which are the white um, structure here during the time where they're naturally breeding in the wild and then this, the oyster spat or seed will settle on them and you can break them off the collectors later, which you can see down the bottom is some spat, some wild spat. So we trialled this on the island and we did some training in construction and different site selection and also looked at traditional knowledge and oyster farming technology. So this structure is a southern oyster farming spat collector, but we needed the local knowledge to know where they were settling naturally in the wild and more about this particular species and where to put these collectors and the timings to do that. However, um, our wild spat collection and this species, the yield is so low that it's not, um, you can't support commercial quantities of farming. You don't get enough spat each year to support what you need to stock on your farm um, for a commercially, commercial level farm. So that's why um, hatchery production is a preferred method of um, spat development. Um, so basically it's essential for industry development but it's expensive and you need specialised skills, which we do have at the Aquaculture Centre. Uh, and research is key to commercial hatchery production because it's a new species to aquaculture. Firstly, you need to close the life cycle to be able to breed the species in captivity uh, and then to optimise the culture methods so that you don't, you don't kill the animal that you grow it instead. Um, so it's different, it's quite different because it's not, there's no um, protocols developed and the protocols developed for other rock oysters that we farm in Australia are all cold water species, whereas this is a warm water species. Uh, there is protocols developed for pearl oysters, which are tropical uh, oysters, but they're a very different animal to a rock oyster, so the methods, you can't directly apply them across species. Anyway, this graph here shows um, the mean larval APM, which is basically length, and then the larval age. So larvae, um, they usually settle so spat of about 21 days. And you can see down the bottom, these lines here are our hatchery, historical hatchery production. So really, um, we didn't know at the time, but quite slow growth. And they settle at about 21 days. Um, whereas after we did a series of research and development uh, and applied these to commercial scale production, we were able to get these growth curves. So the larvae growing much faster They've grown a lot bigger than we ever thought was possible, so setting at about 320 microns long instead of 240 microns. And they're settling earlier, so at about 18 days. And so this, this uh, improvement in production allowed us to produce enough spat uh, for Golden Island to put in a small scale commercial farm. So instead of producing tens of thousands of spat with the methods unoptimised methods. With optimised methods, we're now able to produce hundreds of thousands of spat. Uh, the next step here is to improve settlement rates so we can get the larvae up to that 18 day settlement, but our settlement percentages are quite low. They're about 10% in a good run and a commercial settlement percentage is about 30%. And if we can do that, then and that's what our research is focusing on at the moment, then we can go from hundreds of thousands of spat to millions, which is full scale um, commercial production. Um, but where do the spat go? So they go out to Goulburn Island, which I showed you on the map earlier, in Arnhem Land. So three sites were originally trialled. The community uh, is near Mulbark site here. And then we also tried a site at Fletcher's and another one at Wigu. And we looked at the growth and survival of oysters between the sites. We also did water quality sampling. And we looked at access issues. So the Wigu site, you can't get to by car all year round. There's a floodplain in the middle, um, so you need to access it by boat in the wet season, um, whereas the other two sites are accessible all year by car or boat. 
And we trialled a lot of different grow out systems. Um, so basically we went from this first photo post and rail system, so baskets tied onto posts, uh, to a floating basket system, which is uh, widely used in southern Australia, and then to intertidal long lines. Um, there's pros and cons to each method. The first method didn't hold up very well in cyclones. Uh, the second method, you need a boat basically to get to your floating baskets. They also foul up quite quickly because the oysters are always in the water, so they need a lot more maintenance. So if the boat's not working or if there's a funeral on that goes for a couple of months, your oysters can die in that system. Um, whereas the intertidal longline system had worked out quite well. Each low tide, they oysters dry out and so it helps control fouling. You need less management. You can access it by walking out at low tide. So it helps with crocodile issues. Um, and they're actually, they're really good. We've had a few cyclones go through and we haven't had any issues with the system. Um, growth and survival was really good and preliminary grow-out trials showed very promising growth rates, so about 18 months to market size, which is 70 millimetres. Um, this is competitive with Pacific oysters and, and better than Sydney rock oysters, which are the two main species sold on the Australian market. And so we went with the intertidal long line system. Um, so based on that hatchery success, Golden Island was able to upscale their farm. So in September 2018, they installed 200 metres of oyster long line. And since then, they've installed probably another 200 metres. And we went through different uh, management techniques like grading, cleaning the baskets, so taking care of overcatch and, and fouling. Because if, you, uh, if your baskets foul up, then it reduces the water flow through them and the water is the food. Uh, long line maintenance, so keeping, making sure your long lines are attentioned and uh, looked after, and oyster harvesting and processing and packaging, which is pretty straightforward. They come pre-packaged. Just go through a few of our extension practices. So the partnership is initiated by traditional owners, and we're now working in um, Groot Elliott as well. So we're only working with communities and in communities that, that want us there. And the photos on the left is um, working out at Groot, setting up an oyster farm there. Um, we work together, so we work alongside the people that are on the ground. Um, they And we employ people, local people as research assistants when we visit the islands. Uh, we share knowledge and learn from each other. We also have a lot of research partnerships. Um, we know that we don't know it all and, and we're still learning about oyster farming as well. So we have a strong research link with Sunshine Coast Uni, um, our local Charles Darwin Uni and uh, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries who have been farming and working with Sydney rock oysters for a very long time. And we learn from others, so the photo in the middle, we visited Malaysia a couple of years ago. They farm tropical oysters there and they one of the only tropical oyster hatcheries. They're different species but there's still a lot that can be learned um, across both. And we learn a lot from southern oyster farmers and there's also communication with and between the two the different communities. So two main ones at the moment are Groot and Goulburn and other project partners. So we've got project partners in Western Australia as well. Extension challenges. There's always challenges working remotely. So yeah, being an hour flight away from the site, um, it's quite remote. Getting things in and out, it can be a challenge. So they need to go on the barge, which means you need to plan things weeks or months in advance. Uh, well, they, they can't fit on the plane. We have really big tides in the Northern Territory. Um, so we only have, and in the dry season, we have all of our um, low tides, which is where we do our work, where we can walk out to the farm, where it's a bit safer for crocodiles. They happen at night time. So you can see on the left there, the guy's working at night on a nursery system. So that can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, crocodiles, box jellyfish and cyclones. When there's um, cyclone warnings, your flight might be cancelled at the last minute and you can't, you can't fly out to site. And you need to be really careful with crocodiles uh, and box jellyfish as well if you're working in the water at all. Aquaculture also requires specialised knowledge, so that can sometimes be a challenge. And there's pressures of community life. Um, if the long lines are too close to the communities, some of the kids tend to eat the oysters. It's, um, it's a lot better now, but that can be a challenge. And COVID-19 was a really big challenge. We couldn't travel um, for quite a while. 
which made things a little bit difficult. Um, but so what's the future vision? So I'll just play these two clips here. Bruno will talk about oysters being their gold mine. Uh, but basically, it's the sustainable development of a commercial scale farm on Golden Island and the sale of black lit rock oysters into Darwin restaurants. So the first sale will happen later this year into Darwin, but I'll just play these videos. With, with the oyster program, uh, I've always talked about uh, mining over the mainland. You, you find minerals over the mainland, copper, bauxite, uh, gold, and uh, whatever. Here on the island, we have hit a gold mine, which is an oyster farm. That is our gold mine, and it's a great and the result of our struggle over the last five years and hopefully in the near future uh, at the Darwin restaurant will be the Golden Island Oasis. That uh, Oasis Ground. And just, yeah, thank you to all the partners for their support and participation. A project like this doesn't happen without good funding and good collaboration between many different organisations. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. That was great. It was very interesting. But I actually have a question. Um, so is there plans to, um, like future plans, obviously you're thinking bigger, to um, sort of extend to you know, greater regions than, the, than Darwin restaurants? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it really depends on the community and at what scale they want their oyster farm to be at. So at the moment, um, Golden Island's the only community with market size oysters ready to sell and there's a really big demand coming from Darwin and they want to target the high-end restaurant um, kind of trade. And also the aquaculture licensing process is still underway in Australia. There's a lot of regulations around selling seafood product um, and so... This, they're just going through that process at the moment and we're going through it as well because we don't have um, aquaculture licensing set up for rock oyster farming in the Northern Territory. It's new fisheries. Um, so at the moment, they're basically going to... They won't have enough product to satisfy the Darwin market. Um, so that's why they've chosen to, to target uh, restaurants in Darwin. Um, but that Goulburn are interested in selling... Um, throughout Australia and they, they get calls, they get a lot of calls uh, every month about people wanting to buy their oysters. Um, but yeah, it will really depend long term. It will depend on what scale the community wants to farm at because the bigger your farm is, the more work is involved in employees. Um, there's also some traditional owner groups that are interested in just having farms to sell into the community because um, oysters are eaten locally as well and, and you can actually buy frozen Pacific New Zealand oysters in the community stores as well um, or your local market there. Yeah, okay, and, and the um, profits go back to the community, obviously? Yeah, yep. Um, so at the moment with the Goulburn Farm, so uh, they probably more than 50% of the infrastructure have invested their own money, the Barney Aboriginal Corporation, and then we run research trials on a portion of that farm. We cover our own costs and employ research assistants. Um, but, yeah, they cover their own costs for maintaining the farm and the grow out of the oysters and the staffing and then the whatever from the sales will go back to the community. Um, Sam, so we have some questions coming through in the chat. There's one here from Sayo and she's asked, are there specific water temperatures the black lip oysters favour? Uh, as well as, is the black lip oyster found anywhere else? And could this particular oyster be transferred to the Pacific Islands as an industry? Sorry, three questions there. Yep. No, they're all good questions. Um, water temperatures, black lip oyster favours, yeah, warm, warm water. They um, grow pretty well in the wet season up here and our water temperatures are about 32 degrees. Um, but they're found as far as Bowen in Queensland, so it can get quite cool down there in the water. Um, but then as far as I know, they haven't yet been found any lower than um, Bowen in Queensland. Um, they're found all throughout the uh, tropics, so Borneo, Malaysia. Um, this genetic, We did a genetic study and... Um, They've been found there. They're, they're found in Fiji, 
and they were they're found in New Caledonia and they grow there. Um, so yes, they could definitely be transferred to the Pacific Islands. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's a farm on Mango Island in Fiji, which um, is a local guy who collects wild spat and grows it out. There's also um, someone who farms black in New Caledonia based on wild seed, but their catches are still quite small. And the hat there's a hatchery in New Caledonia that's really interested in being able to produce them in the hatchery too. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, there's another question here as well from Nitya, and she's asked, was one of the COVID-19 challenges theft or early harvest of oysters by community members? I'm curious as money, food pressures on local communities may have affected them. Ah, no, um, hi Nitya. Um, the COVID-19 challenges are more around us not being able to get out there and, and do um, some of the research and data collection, but the communities were able to, um, to do that without us perfectly well. Um, the money and the theft happened really early in the uh, community um, oyster farming trials. So when the, I don't know if you remember, oh, I can actually go back to it. When the map, uh, on the map, when we tried a site really close to the community, um, Muldbark here, uh, the kids would go down and eat all the oysters, which they probably just <laughs> enjoyed doing and they sometimes get a little bit bored. Um, but as soon as we put the oyster farm in Fletcher's and there was a lot more community engagement and um, it sat under Yagbani Aboriginal Corporation, there was a bit more uh, ownership and authority over the farm and we didn't have those issues anymore. Um, so uh, they weren't, they definitely weren't at, at the same point in time, they were years apart. Um, in COVID-19, probably was a bit of a different situation for Indigenous communities compared to other Pacific Island um, areas. So they, well, there was actually a lot of money around in communities at the time because people were allowed to access their super. And so everyone took as much as they were allowed out of their super. And there was a lot of card card games going on and, and vehicles being bought overnight with some of the winnings. So I think it was probably a different situation to other areas. It's really interesting, Sam. You've just made me think, um, how many people do live on the Gorgon Island? Like how large yeah. is the community? Yeah, uh, about 300. But that's pretty rough. It can um, double in the dry season. A lot of people come back. Um, to the community in the dry season and, and live in the outstations and um, and a lot of people go into town in the wet um, into Darwin and yeah if there's a funeral on it can be a lot more as well um, it's all pretty connected through island land the different communities so there's a lot of moving around yeah great thank you um, there was also a comment Sam from Patrick he's just said really interesting um, perhaps Sam or Paul could talk about the parallels in the Pacific um, and small island developing states. Uh, yeah. I think Sam already has. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm reading through the comments and I probably missed that part there. Sorry. I, I, I can elaborate. Um, I went to, uh, as part of my PhD, I, I got a small um, the Crawford Fund grant to travel to Fiji and Tonga to look at some of Paul's work on the pearl oyster handicraft in Fiji and Tonga. And that's a different species of oyster. It's a pearl oyster. It's kind of a different, um, it's not for food, it's for jewellery. Um, but there are a lot of parallels. Um, it's, and, and it basically is like walking into your own, pro, into a different project in the Northern Territory. It could be quite similar. There's some massive differences. And there's some massive differences between even just communities in the Northern Territory, depending on their governance structure. Um, and the welfare system in Australia makes things very different to the Pacific Islands. Um, but yeah, at, at the end of the day, it's people living really remotely in island communities um, that are wanting to create industries that are sustainable and can support them to live on country. So I think there's definitely a lot of similarities across that. Common things are interesting. Mm, Less really crocs and box jellyfish in the Pacific. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a little bit safer with the environment and that. Is. Well, in PNG, there was a lot of crocs. They're just in shot. Yeah, care. so it might be a little bit safer to swim. <laughs> well, thank you, Sam. Um, I'm just going to check and see if there's any more comments there. 
There I have it. one, Sam. Okay. And it <laughs> relates to markets, market access, and economics. So taking research and making it into a profitable industry or industry sector. <clears throat> now, um, th this farm site is very remote. I'm guessing that uh, transportation to the market, the, in the first market in Darwin, that you mentioned is an issue and is expensive. So I'm wondering, what, it, what have you done any economic analysis to work out what the markets are, how big the markets are, what the level of profitability will be, et cetera, and how you're gonna deal with frozen products from the Southern states of Australia, competing or potentially coming in at a lower price. Just yeah. interested in what you've done, how have you thought <laughs> through that? Yeah, that's a really good point, Paul. Um, at the moment, the quantity is quite low that it can be flown and freight from Goulburn, there's a regular flight that happens each day, is actually not too expensive. Um, the other option is to barge it. If you're getting high quantities, then your freight becomes more expensive on the plane and you'll need to barge, which means you need to have um, prolonged shelf life. But if you can get a uh, fresh oyster from Warrawee to Darwin in an hour and to a restaurant and it's can be eaten fresh, you can get a premium price for that product, which is where they're targeting restaurants at the moment. Uh, we haven't done extensive research into um, how many oysters the Darwin community could take and then when, at what level would you need to go to the Sydney like market, for example, or in, within Australia. Just because there's been so much demand and no actual product being pushed out. So we're only just, so the first sale will happen at the end of this year. Of oysters and then the next will be about another year off at Warrawee and the group ones are, are spat now so they're two years away um, so that's why we haven't looked at that and we've just been trying really hard to actually close the life cycle and get spat hat produced from the hatchery out um, but that will become a really important part of the research moving forward uh, and economic analysis is really really uh, important but you also need really good ground data to go into good economic analysis. Otherwise, you're just pulling figures out of thin air, which um, people, which has been done before and you can do, but it's not really that meaningful. So once we get the first few sales and some proof of um, selling the product into Darwin, prices and freight um, and prices that they can realistically get because people can say they'll buy them for so much, but it's not until restaurants have to put their money on the table that you actually realise what, what the price of the oysters worth, and if they are willing to pay more than, than an imported Pacific oyster or a Sydney rock. Um, yeah, so getting that data back from these sales is really important to be able to put into economic forecasting um, for the future of the industry. So do you see them eventually competing with Sydney rocks in, in the Sydney fish market, for example? I mean, is that is that something you're aspiring to? Definitely, but it's a niche market at the moment. Uh, such a small quantity and it's likely to be seasonal because there's times of the year that um, black lip oysters are in very good eating condition and there's times of the year, so our winter, that, that they're not in good eating condition, so it wouldn't be advantageous to sell. Um, so at the moment, I would see it as more of a high-end restaurant uh, niche product than a directly competing for like quantity-wise. Yeah, good. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you know everything I already said. Paul. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone wants to get in touch or um, hear more about what we're doing up here, you can email me or we do take people for work experience. So if you're interested in, in visiting Darwin and, and um, helping out in Hatchery at the Aquaculture Centre, just to get, just get in touch. Just one more little question, Sam, before you go, um, relating to the extension work that you do and, or dissemination, I guess, more than extension. I'm guessing that you know word about word resuccess in aquaculture projects travels quite quickly. Are you getting um, other communities now saying, "Can we have a well, where, where's our farm? Can you come and set one up for us?" How, yeah. How do you manage that? <laughs> yeah, we do have a lot of that, and it's a um, we wish we could help everyone. At the moment, Warrawi and Groot are our focus communities, and that we produce goes to them. Um, but once we move out of a research phase and into the development phase and we can reliably produce commercial quantities of spat, uh, then we can sell spat to different farms and ventures. Um, but yeah, 
a goal across the and, and that's part of also setting up the aquaculture licensing process. So it's a clear process for communities that want to set a farm up to apply for an aquaculture license and uh, go through that process. Um, with it, we can support them to do that. But yeah, at the moment we just have to focus on two communities and um, prove and to basically prove the feasibility and focus on the hatchery production. Too much interest and not enough spat at the moment is our problem. Yeah, good. Now, as you know, it's a problem we have in the Pacific. Everybody wants a pearl farm, but there's only a, a limited number of spat coming from the hatchery um, and um, fisheries officers that can support those communities. So uh, I guess it's the same issue with you. That would be those farmers that can't grow citrus successfully you'd be talking about. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just make one more point. Who of can't, difference. though? Who is that, Steve? I thought everyone could do that successfully with their IT systems. <laughs> One more point of difference there um, with the Northern Territory is that there's a lot of um, Southern people that are interested in investing in tropical oyster farming in the North and partnering with communities um, to do that. And so there's money there. There's people that have partnerships and investment um, to set up farms. So they basically just want to be able to source the spat from us. They don't necessarily... Um, want their farm to be a project farm. They have investment for a commercial scale farm. It's the stat that they need. Yeah. And um, another point also is that 80% of the coastline is Indigenous owned and um, in the Northern Territory. And um, the, it's the intertidal zone is also Aboriginal land. So and the, at, the, at this, this type of farming that we're talking about, intertidal rock oyster farming happens in the intertidal zone. So there does need to be um, indigenous and engagement, so it's not going to look it's not going to look like New South Wales oyster farming industry. Sam, there's just another comment that's come through in the chat here from Salot, and I hope I've pronounced your name correctly there, Salot. But in Vanuatu, before this um, black lip species is potentially, if it was to be introduced to the Pacific. What are the chances that it might not become an invasive species, that it might hinder the local indigenous species? And this is just a question. Um, they've explained that they're not an expert, but it is their concern because you mentioned that your species of study thrives in warm waters and they're surrounded by warm water in Vanuatu. So it's highly likely. Um, they've just said, it's just a question, so please ignore if it's not relevant in Vanaka. That's relevant. Um, it may already be in the in Vanuatu as a native species. I wouldn't be surprised if it occurs there naturally. Um, and whether it's introduced or not, I guess it depends on um, who, how it's introduced. And yeah, if it yeah if it stays there, then but I but I imagine if it's found close to the area, it. it if it's not already, if it's already there, it's a native species and it's not already there, there's a reason why, whether it cannot settle or the spat don't do well or breed well there and then maybe it won't take if it is introduced. So there's parts along the Northern Territory coastline that black lip aren't found naturally. Um, and I think it's because they're, they're, river, they're at the mouth of rivers that push out a lot of sediment and the spat don't like high sediment loads. Um, so there's a reason why they're not naturally found there. And they probably wouldn't do very well if they were farmed there. But yeah, good question. I had one question just from okay. the room. Um, I was just wondering, Sam, if there are any sort of like climate hazards that affect the oyster production? So I'm thinking things like temperature change or pH change or things like that that might be a consideration with climate change. Ocean acidification effects. Um, all shell forming um, animals, so that's definitely a potential issue in the future. I think there's a lot of, well, there is a lot of farmers in the east coast and west coast of Australia that would would like it if um, climate change meant their waters warmed a little bit more naturally there, because uh, they can farm, which potentially doesn't have the disease issues that the current species have. Um, so I was just talking to a farmer in um, Moreton Bay who really wants to farm black lip oysters, but they're not currently naturally found there, so he's not able to at the moment. 
Um, but yeah, there's a potential that they could move further south with warming waters. I just want to thank Sam. I thought she did a great job and it was really interesting. And um, as she mentioned, there was opportunities for um, someone to, or if opportunities for work experience. So if anyone's interested in um, Sam's contact details, uh, we can, you can send information or send the request through to us and we can send it through to Sam. But if everyone can just give Sam a round of applause and thank her. And we'll see you for the next Pacific Island seminar series. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.